it's very nice. It's very nice to be here. And, and so, what I'm going to do um, is really, I'm going to presume that most of you here are either think of yourselves or will come to think of yourselves as the the the, the first generation of drug policy reform activists in South Africa and in Africa more broadly. And I'm, so I'm, and I'm, I, because I've been involved in this all of my adult life as a researcher, as a professor, as an activist, as a provocateur, uh, as an expert, um, that's the frame in which I'm going to be speaking here, both for those of you from South Africa and also I see some friends who I met in Tanzania, uh, Tanzania and Kenya last year, but in terms of both nationally and in regionally in this area. If you don't feel yourselves part of that group, well, I'm giving you some secrets about how we do what we do, but uh, hopefully most of you will. So I began, and I'll make this a little bit personal because as, as um, Sean mentioned, I just stepped down a few months ago from running the organization that I founded uh, 17 years ago, Drug Policy Alliance, which is a leading organization in the US advocating for alternatives to the war on drugs. But I've been working and writing on this for 30 years. And I began in my activism in the late 1980s when the war on drugs in the US and by the US around the world was going crazy. It was, that was America's war of the late 1980s and early 1990s. We did not have any other wars at this time. When you don't have a real war, you create a war in order to sort of get people's energies focused in the right direction. People were hysterical. Some of you may know the, his, the history of McCarthyism in the US when, when the anti-communism craziness of America in the early 1950s, the, the war on drugs at that point in America was like McCarthyism on steroids. I mean, anything. It was like a crusade. You would have congressmen and legislators passing one law and saying, let's double the penalties on drug dealers. No, let's quadruple the penalties. Let's increase the fines. Let's quadruple the fines. Let's build our prison populations. We will build as many prisons as we need to. We will lock up as many people as we can. You had Mrs. Reagan, the first lady of the United States, Ronald Reagan's wife, saying the most dangerous people in America are the recreational consumers of marrow of cannabis, right? I mean, this was the atmosphere. And to some good extent, I've devoted my life to trying to wind down that craziness in my country and around the world. Um, it was as if we were on a crusade. And we're the drug users, the drug addicts, the drug dealers, the drug pushers, the junkies. They were the ones who were destroying our youth, destroying our nation. And because we are America, the United States of America, it meant that what we thought was good for us just must be good for the rest of the world, too. <laughs> and we had the power to impose those views, to do it in our bilateral relations, in our multilateral relations, through the United Nations. Right? We had the ability to shape the global conventions that all nations live under. We had the ability to tell Mexico and Colombia and countries in Europe and Asia what they better do on this thing. We took our own anti-drug ads and had them translated into dozens of languages, even though they had no cultural reference to these places, because that's what we did. Now, we justified it by saying, we don't want your drugs coming into our country. But in point of fact, there was never any way to stop drugs from coming into our country. Because you don't need to be a brilliant economist to know that where there is a demand, there will be a supply. And sometimes different networks and different dealers can help facilitate and expedite those. But where there is a demand, there will be a supply, right? It is helpful to think about the international markets in heroin and amphetamine and cocaine and, and in cannabis really as global commodities markets. Very much the same as the global markets in tobacco and alcohol, in tea and coffee and precious metals and other agricultural materials. Right? Where there is a demand, there will be a supply. If one source gets knocked out, say coffee, whatever it might be, because of a drought or a blight or some problem in the markets, does that mean that all of a sudden people in other countries have no coffee to drink? <laughs> 
No, it means that there's an opportunity for other countries to fill the void. And similarly, in these illicit drug markets, when one country gets knocked out by a drought or a blight or a, a temporarily successful law enforcement operation, others emerge. We saw that with heroin. Heroin coming from the French connection from Turkey through Paris to America in the 1970s. Shut that one down. Well, then it started to come from Southeast Asia. The United States shut that one down and started to come from Southwest Asia. Shut that one down and started to come from Colombia and Mexico. Eventually, we pushed down so many places, it popped up everywhere, right? And so there was, with cocaine, pushed down on Bolivia, pop up in Peru, push down in Peru, pop up in, 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 in Colombia, you know, once again. And of course, with a drug like cannabis, which can grow almost everywhere, well, it doesn't almost matter where you push down because it's going to be popping up sometimes all by itself without even any human involvement, <laughs> right? The other thing we realized about drugs was that there's almost never been a drug-free society in human history, right? Almost every society in history has used psychoactive drugs to alter their states of consciousness. It's remarkable how different groups of people living all around the world with almost no contact with other societies somehow figured that, you know, that piece of fruit or whatever, if it allowed to ferment, wow, that made me feel good. I mean, not, not just fruit, but fruit and vegetables and dairy. In Siberia, they use yak's milk that they ferment. Anything will work. You know, hunter-gatherer societies. Hmm, that mushroom tastes good. That mushroom, that will kill me. That mushroom, I'm seeing God, right? It, it's, I mean, this fact of the matter is this desire to alter our states of consciousness is virtually universal. And one of the key questions for drug policy is how we learn to manage. How do we best manage human beings' innate need to alter their state of consciousness and the virtual universality with which rely on psychoactive substances, both naturally grown and synthetic, in order to do that? Do we rely on wars on drugs and wars on, because wars on drugs are really wars on people? Do we do that? Or do we adopt a framework that says drugs are here to stay? whether we like it or not. There is no building a moat between those drugs and our children, between those drugs and our communities. The question is, do we deal with this reality of drugs in ways that are rational, sensible, compassionate, grounded in science, and basic human values? Now, there's something quite distinctive in this area. Because one of the interesting questions is, why is it that some drugs are legal and others criminalized? Why is that? Is it because of the relative dangers of drugs? That alcohol and tobacco or some pharmaceutical drugs are less dangerous than the cannabis, the cocaine, the amphetamine, the, the heroin? Well. As David Nutt, I'm sure, will explain tomorrow, not really. Not really. Alcohol, we know, has a greater association with violent behavior than any of the illicit drugs. Tobacco, nicotine consumed in the form of combustible tobacco, is a remarkably addictive and deadly substance. When the researchers interview heroin addicts and they ask, which is the toughest drug to quit? You know what most cigarette smokers say? I'm sorry, what most heroin consumers say? <laughs> cigarettes, right? Heroin addicts say it's tougher to quit cigarettes than to quit heroin. So what explains why some are legal and others illegal? It's not the relative risks of these drugs. Instead, it is the matter of who uses particular drugs and who is perceived to use particular substances that determines which drugs are criminalized and which ones are not. Let me give you the example of my country. In the United States, for the not mid to late 19th century, virtually all of these substances that are now illegal were legal. Cannabis was legal. It was in the pharmacopoeia, right? You know, cocaine, legal. You know, Coca-Cola had cocaine in it until 1900. Opiates, opium in all sorts of forms, edible, drinkable, injectable, all legal, right? The principal consumers of opiates in my country, 
in the 1870s were middle-class white women. Those were the principal consumers. Using them because this was before aspirin, this was before, this was before penicillin, this was when, when sanitation was not good, when people you know, um, had diarrhea, and the best thing to stop you up when you have diarrhea is opiates because of the constipation effect. Right? It was where we had nothing to deal with pain except the opiates. And you know what? Nobody thought about making opium and opiates illegal at that time because nobody wanted to put their white grandmama or auntie in jail. <laughs> but when the Chinese began to arrive in our country in the 1870s and 80s, working long hours on the mines and in the railroads, oftentimes bringing with them their tradition of smoking their opium in the evening, just as the white Americans would drink their alcohol in the evening, well, that's where all of a sudden the media went crazy. Oh, those Chinamen with their disgusting smoking habit uh, setting up their opium dens where they lure and seduce and addict white women to become their sex slaves. And the first opium prohibition laws in my country were passed in the 1870s and 1880s in Nevada and in California, specifically directed at the Chinese minorities. Cocaine, as I said, and Coca-Cola until 1900, and so far as we know, the Coca-Cola addiction problem with cocaine was no worse than the Coca-Cola addiction problem today without cocaine, but with caffeine, which is not so bad, right? All sorts of people used it. Sigmund Freud used it. Other people used it. A famous wine, Van Mariani, the Bordeaux wine infused with coca in it that was uh, drunk by emperors and princesses and popes and actors and generals. But when it, I came identified with black men working on the docks in New Orleans 120 years ago, and these black men taking this white powder up their noses and potentially losing their, forgetting their proper place in society, that's when we saw the first criminalizations of cocaine. When the word went out from police departments that it's impossible to bring down a Negro crazed on cocaine with a 38 revolver, you need a 45 because they're so super powerful with this. Those were where cocaine prohibition laws began at our state levels. With cannabis, eh, not such a big issue. But when it became identified with Mexican migrants and Mexican Americans in the southwest and the western states of my country, beginning in 1913, 1914 in El Paso, Texas, then California and elsewhere, that's where you began to see the first criminalizations of cannabis. In every case about who was using these substances, even our history with alcohol prohibition, what was alcohol prohibition? To some extent, about a broader cultural political fight between the white, white Americans and the not-so-white, white Americans. Between the white, white Americans who came to America in the late 18th, early 19th, 19th century from Northern and Western Europe, and the not-so-white, white Americans coming from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe in the late 19th and early 20th century, flooding into the United States, freaking people out the same way that the migration from Central America and Mexico does for Donald Trump supporters today, <laughs> and resulting in all sorts of xenophobic behavior and the fear of these habits of their vino and their beer and their Schlivowitz. Schlivowitz is a prune liquor from Eastern... Never mind. It's always been about that. Even Nixon's war on black people and the hippies doing all that LSD in the 1960s and 70s, right? So understanding the powerful racial dimensions, and not just in the US, mind you, because if you look in Australia, in Canada, in England, xenophobia regarding Chinese was also played a role. If you go down to South America and you ask the question, how did it come about that the chewing of the coca leaf, coca, you know, coca a little bit like cot, right? You know, that the chewing of the coca leaf, it, you know, which had almost no negative health consequence associated with it, becomes criminalized by these countries. And where the diplomats of Peru and other countries advocate for the criminalization of a product which is indigenous in their parts of the world for thousands of years, well, it was because of the much lighter skinned the whiter elites in these countries 
part of their international medical societies, their international diplomatic groups, looking down their noses at the campesinos, the poor peasants chewing their coca leaf and blaming their lower economic situation on their bulging cheeks of coca that resulted in that. If you go to China today, you see racial, the minority of the Uyghurs in Western China demonized and once again with their drugs and all of this. You go to other parts of the world, the same thing. You go to Russia, you see demonized minorities. If you look, whenever any autocrat is looking for somebody to blame, whether it's Ceausescu, the former Romanian dictator, blame it on those drug-using students. It's always one because you know that even sometimes the most enlightened of your citizens, the ones who believe in human rights and good values, but even the most enlightened citizens, we fear for the well-being of our children. We worry about those other, sometimes darker-skinned, poorer people. And because we are in what we know about drugs does not come from the science or the health, but comes from the images and the media, the television, the propaganda of government. Indeed, I would say that within, even within this group here of forward-thinking people, sometimes the greatest obstacle we have to overcome is our own, the fact that by growing up in our societies, we assimilated and absorbed many of the anti-drug uh, images and facts that, that, that permeate this field. And that we need, an, the part of the process of educating others is in educating and enlightening ourselves and not being comfortable in believing that we have that already settled in our own selves. Now, in my country, what happened beginning in the 1970s was an absolute monstrosity. In the 1970s, the rate of incarceration in my country was not so different from the rest of the world. We were about average. Today, the United States, with less than 5% of the world's population, has almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. We have the highest per capita incarceration rate in the world. The Russians keep huffing and puffing to keep up with us, but we left them in the dust. We are number one when it comes to locking up our fellow citizens. We have the highest rate of incarceration of any democratic society in history. We lock up more people for a drug law, nonviolent drug law violation, than all of Western Europe, by which I mean the original e European Union countries lock up for everything, and they have 100 million more people than we do. If somebody ever says to you, oh, we should look at what America's doing on criminal justice policies, run as far away as you can, as fast as you can. Because what we, if, if, if our country, if my country was average when it came to locking people up, and another country was locking up people the way we do, we would condemn them for a monstrous violation of human rights. Now, when it comes to who's going to prison, The rate of incarceration of African Americans, to a lesser extent Latinos, but especially African Americans, there's no comparison in really history. The rate at which Stalin locked up people in the gulags of the 30s and 40s is tiny compared to the rate at which we lock up black people in America. The racism that drove not just the origins of this war on drugs, which I explained, but the evolution and the implementation. The reason why Congress and many state legislatures 30 years ago passed laws saying that five grams of smokable crack cocaine will get you the same penalty as 500 grams of powder cocaine was to some very good extent because smokable crack cocaine was seen as the poor black man's drug, and the powder cocaine was seen as the white man's drug. The doctors, the scientists said there's no rational basis for that distinction. It's the same drug. But that did not stop that racially discriminatory law. It meant that in terms of enforcement, well, in terms of the culture, when it became no longer legitimate to use racist phrases and to point out and blame things on black people as black people, when you needed to come up with a new code language and a code word, what happened was the drug users, the junkies, the pushers became the word where you knew that most people, when they heard you use the phrase junkie, pusher, dealer, that you would imagine a young black man. It became the coded text for advancing racism in another way. 
It's why when a wonderful author in my country, Michelle Alexander, wrote a book called The New Jim Crow, you know what Jim Crow was, right? In America, we went from slavery to the oppressive apartheid-like laws of the South that we call Jim Crow, right? And she referred to the new Jim Crow as being the drug war in America that began in the late 1970s and 1980s. That was actually, in fact, giving more black people in America criminal records and locking them up than were enslaved before the Civil War in my country. So what relevance does that have here? Let me make a few points in this regard. First, it is important to understand the extent to which prohibitionist laws and norms, to which the demonization associated with drugs is embedded and grounded in the xenophobia and racism of the past. It is important to understand the extent to which the laws that you live under today emerged not because wise doctors and scientists gathered together to say what drugs should we prohibit and which one should we not, but because they were influenced by racial and other prejudices that manifested in the creation of the drug prohibition laws that we have today. It is important to realize that the people charged with enforcing these laws, the, the police and the prosecutors and the judges, oftentimes do not even know the origins of these laws. They simply assume the moral judgment or public health wisdom behind the laws without ever stopping to think to question them because after all, it is not the job of people in law enforcement to question the origins or examine the origins of the laws they enforce or to wonder whether or not they are just. Us. Their job, they are sworn to enforce the law. So in some respects, we cannot blame them for enforcing laws that originated in justice. But it is to say that even in this country and this, con con and this continent, it is not to say that America's experience in a majority white society with a demonized black minority is irrelevant, but to say that there is a similarity in these origins. Now let me say, make a second point here. And this is a little more controversial. When I began in this advocacy in the U.S. 30 years ago, and it was already apparent, the racism of the drug war, there were, with few exceptions, remarkably few black people standing up to condemn the drug war. There were some, a brave mayor in Baltimore, Kurt Schmoke, some intellectuals, a few others but remarkably little. Why? Why? Because they had bought into the same norms as had all the white people out there? Because they believed, well, you did the crime, you got to do the time. I remember hearing that a lot. Because they would say, you, white man, you don't know the devastation that our community has suffered as a result of drugs. That's why we need a drug war. To which I would respond, I see that devastation. But don't you understand the extent to which so much of that devastation is a result not of drug use per se, but of the prohibitionist drug war-like policies that are victimizing your communities? Do you not see that all the police and all the prisons in the world cannot and will not reduce the availability of drugs in poor communities? All they will do is to ship thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of mostly young black men and sometimes women to prisons away from their home where they will be acculturated into lives of criminality and deprived of those opportunities to get jobs once they come back and shift resources from the areas that could help people to those that punish people? When, you know, America, we had alcohol, national alcohol prohibition for 14 years from 1919 to 1933. Many of those who supported it were African-American leaders, church leaders. Why? Because they came from the church, and the church knew that alcohol was an evil, and the church believed that we should eradicate this evil. And they advocated for prohibition, and prohibition came. And then guess who the prohibition agents focused on in enforcing prohibition laws? Did they go after the person sitting in the mayor's office or the affluent white business people? No, they went after the people who were poor and vulnerable. I remember some of the people I used to debate were Reverend Jesse Jackson and the Harlem congressman, very powerful, Charlie Rangel, 
two of the most powerful black politicians in America. And they were, well, they didn't want to be as tough as the Republicans, but we need that drug war. A drug-free society, we can do it. That was the rhetoric. Well, we engaged in a massive violation of human rights in a disproportionately black human rights in my country. And eventually, people began to wake up. And eventually, Jesse Jackson and Charlie Rangels began to change. Why? In part because they saw a new and younger generation of African-American leaders saying, enough, enough. Right? Some of the leading opponents of needle exchange programs were not just white racists but black politicians and black church leaders who believed that AIDS was God's punishment for sin, who believed that drug use was fundamentally immoral and that if people needed to die, well, then that then was God's justice. And they were not called to account and have never been called to account for the fact that in my country, with nothing compared to your country, but over a quarter million people have died, not just drug users, but their lovers and their babies as a result of the failure to embrace the sorts of public health approaches that became standard in Europe while my country let people die. The importance to not allow complicity in this system that for people who fought against apartheid in this system to then to imagine that the same notions we apply to apartheid should now be applied to people who use drugs, to people who inject drugs, to people who do this? Where is the universal logic of human rights in that way of thinking? Is it simply because every society needs its boogeyman? And that even those who fight for freedom and justice in a particular area are just as willing as their former oppressors to oppress others in another area? Is that the society that we seek to build or that we seek to allow? Well, now, fortunately, in my country, you see less and less of support among African-American leaders for the drug war. In fact, quite the opposite that with Black Lives Matter and others, the movement for drug policy reform and the movement for racial justice have essentially become increasingly integrated as one. And there's a deep and profound understanding of that. And I think that, hopefully, in your country is a message I can bring from here. Now, it is not, of course, only about race. And it is not only about the people's fear around their children. And it's not only about the profit-driven interests that drive this drug war. Let's remember there's something else going on here. There's an element of class. Race, but also class. I was in Jamaica last year, and we were talking about the issues of race in America. And for my Jamaican friends, all of whom there were, or almost all of whom were black, they were saying to me, Ethan, we have the same phenomena you described, but it's not about race. I mean, there's an element of the darkness of one's skin color, but it's about class. People are smoking ganja, daca, daha, everywhere. Well, we know who gets arrested. We know who the cops pick on. We know what's on. This is about class. This is about social control. This is about policing. This is about the incentives of police systems in terms of how they manage the, the young people who they are afraid of and who other people are afraid of. So the class element cuts across this in ways of hypocrisy that have always been true. It's true in the way we enforce alcohol laws, whether they're prohibition laws or regulatory laws. It's even true, quite frankly, when we look at the issue with tobacco. You know, 50 years ago, smoking was as common in, poor, in, in affluent white neighborhoods as in poor black neighborhoods. And then as the information came out and as taxes went up and deterrent measures come up, you saw affluent people, white, also black, the use has gone down dramatically. But among poor people, where the pleasures of cigarettes loom larger in their life, where the expectations of a long, healthy life are lower, well, for them, cigarettes continue to be more prevalent, bad for their health, but also proportionally a greater source of their pleasure. But it's the same time that you begin to see the greater demonization of smokers, right? and the stigmatization of smokers. Stigma can play a positive role in terms of discouraging behavior, but stigma can go too far and demonization can go too far. So understand the elements of classism in this. And lastly, I don't want to coin this term because I don't think it's an effective term. But with racism and classism, you have also drugism. In a way, drugism. The stigmatization and demonization and criminalization of people based solely upon the substances that they put in their body, that is drugism. 
it is in relatively enlightened societies, the last remaining legitimate, not just prejudice, but violation of human rights and criminalization of people who do, in most cases, no harm to anybody else, and in most cases, not even then to themselves. One of the nature of creating enlightened societies is to say that if you are not engaged in harming your fellow human being, then we, the state, have no right and no power to take away your freedom. Then we no longer discriminate in our criminal law based upon gender or religion or, 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 or sexual preference or race, but we will still discriminate based upon the substance you put in your body. And God forbid a mother has two children struggling with drugs, and one is addicted to alcohol, and one is addicted to heroin, no matter that the doctor says the heroin is relatively less dangerous for the body in a pure condition than the alcohol, no matter. But we know that that woman's two children will be dealt with fundamentally differently. You know, there's a core principle, and I never lead with it in my advocacy, but I oftentimes make it the final punch. I believe we're talking about a fundamental human, human rights principle here, and that is that there is no legitimate basis in science, in medicine, in ethics, or even the Bible for distinguishing amongst or against people based solely upon the substance they put into their body. There is no legitimate basis for discriminating, distinguishing amongst or against people based upon what they put in their body. The moral judgment we have in a free society is to hold people responsible for the harms they may do to others. And if they happen to be a drug addict who start, hurts other people, they still must be held accountable, take their drug addiction into account, but they must be held responsible as human beings responsible for the behavior to others. But simply based upon on what we put into our body, whether by choice or because we are addicted? No, that cannot be a legitimate basis. And that has to be the new and emerging frontier of the struggle for human rights around the world. Sean, do you want me to wrap up or take a few more minutes? <laughs> what? Wrap? Wrap? Okay, so let me just finish with this. Oh, God? So, here's my advice and hope for you as a nascent <clears throat> drug policy reform movement in South Africa and Africa more broadly. <clears throat> First, understand the extent to which you are part of something much bigger. Understand the extent to which there is increasingly a global drug policy reform movement in my country, in Latin America, in Europe, even emerging in parts of Asia, and quite frankly, you know, going to Tanzania and Kenya, hearing what's going on in Ghana now and other countries is inspiring. When you see not just the Global Commission on Drug Policy, but who are the members of the Global Commission on Drug Policy? They now include Kofi Annan, they include former President Obasanjo of Nigeria, and they include the newest member, Joyce Banda from Malawi. There's leadership coming from within this continent as well. Nobody is yet from South Africa, I regret to say, but I hope that that will happen soon. The West African Commission on Drugs, hopefully there will be an emergence of an East African Commission sometime soon. Hopefully there will be a South African or Southern African Commission emerging soon. Understand that those of you who think this way and believe this way are not alone. Understand that you, I believe, and forgive my arrogance in saying so, are following in the footsteps in the boldest and most courageous way of those who fought against apartheid. Because this is a prejudice and an and and unjust policy perpetrated sometimes by the very people who led the fight against apartheid, but somehow think that this war is legitimate. Understand the extent to which science and medicine are on your side. Understand, please, because we have barely mentioned anybody as yet, the role of cannabis, of daha. That issue is not entirely separable from the issues around harm reduction and injection drug use and smoking of cocaine and amphetamine and heroin. They are all illicit substances. They are bound together not because the drugs are similar in effects. They are bound together because they are all subject to criminal prohibitions. Throughout much of the world, over half of all people arrested for illicit drugs are people 
involved in the cannabis industry or people, in fact, in the vast majority of cases, not in the industry, simply consumers or growers, right? Understand that the science increasingly shows cannabis to be among the least dangerous substance, psychoactive substances ever commonly used in human history. Understand that emer all evidence is now emerging in my country where we have a disastrous problem with opioids, both heroin and pharmaceutical opiates, and people dying, uh, no, dying of overdoses at numbers that exceed deaths from HIV AIDS 25 years ago. Understand that we increasingly are finding that cannabis is helpful in helping people not be addicted to opioids, in reducing the amount of opioids that they must take for their pain management. We are finding that for people in drug treatment programs that using cannabis is sometimes beneficial, not harmful, that people even in opioid substitution problems may do better, at least some of them, if they are using cannabis than they are if they're punished and expelled for using cannabis. Understand at this point the remarkable evidence emerging about the potential health benefits of cannabis. Do not separate these issues in your mind. And when you see a court trial going on in, in Johannesburg, Johannesburg around this issue, see that as part of your issue as well. See DACA and what's going on there not as that issue, but as part of the struggle and as something that can potentially be a help. In my country, the fact that we were able to move towards legalizing cannabis, first for medical uses and now more broadly, and where 60% of the country now supports that, doubling what it was, the 30% not so long ago, that that has helped open up a new and more open and lively debate. It, it shifts the brain. It doesn't mean that we will land up legalizing the other drugs for sale in retail markets, but it does mean it will make it easier for us to become more comfortable with the notions of new ideas. Communication. So, I mean, it's very nice. Living in a country, you, I mean, here you have in South Africa, as I understand it, one of the best constitutions in the world, written at a wonderful moment in history from which you all benefit. You have thoughtful people in your public health departments who are allowing some of these initiatives to start. But we still know there's those people out there who say, let's bring back the death penalty and kill all those junkies and drug dealers. We know people who say, let's suspend the Constitution to deal with this drug problem. We know that that lurks in the common population. And we know that when politics turn, as they are turning in my country and in so much of Europe and in Asia, in dark directions as they are now, with a growing support for autocratic government and authoritarianism and for sort of quasi-fascist leaders, that we need to prepare. It's interesting in my country, even with Trump's ascendancy, that the support not just for cannabis reform, but for broader drug policy reform is persisting and is now bipartisan in nature, having been led by the progressives, but now with conservatives embracing it. It means that sometimes we must use, be careful in our language, avoiding or being careful of using the word addicts or junkies or, or words that are disparaging or, or distorting. But I say, on the other hand, Sometimes we must use those words intentionally, if only to gain legitimacy among those people whose hearts are closed to our way of thinking and who can want to execute the junkies. But if you meet them maybe on their language, you can begin to introduce to them the ideas. You can say, I will use that nasty language that they need to hear as a vehicle, as a, as, as a cloak, in order to introduce the more humane ideas. And of course, always bringing it back to people and their own families. The question of what would you do if it was your own child? You have innovations happening here. I did a little tour this morning of District 6 and learned the history there and met some people running a wonderful, uh, a wonderful programs. They're doing, the, the good harm reduction programs happen not just in the wealthy developed world, but they happen in Sao Paulo, and in fact, they're happening in Cape Town. The basic idea of understanding that by providing basic things like a bit of housing or support or a little money to people struggling with drug addiction, you actually can not just help those people, but save the taxpayer money and allow the police to focus on real predatory crime. I look at the numbers of the crime stats in your country, and I see that most crime or reported crime, violent crime, has gone down. Most other crimes have gone down. Burglary has gone up. But drug offenses have tripled in the last 10 years. 
when you see drug offenses tripling, that's not about crime control. It's not about making a safer society. It's oftentimes about allowing the cops to focus on the types of criminal behavior that challenge them the least, like shooting fish in a barrel, instead of going after the real crimes. It means always thinking about how you communicate with that people on the other side and the people in the middle. It means understanding you know, that advocacy and activism are not just about saying whatever's on your mind, but saying what's on your mind and what you know to be true in a language that is understandable and hearable by people who do not think the way that we think. It's understanding that sometimes we have allies in strange places, whether it may be in law enforcement, whether it may be in the church, or interestingly, recently on the international front, I'm seeing sometimes leadership coming from foreign ministries, whereas the health ministries are the biggest obstacle. It means beware sometimes of people who appear to be our allies. The treatment community is a very mixed bag. Some of them deeply wedded to harm reduction principles, some of them offering good abstinence programs, but others in it for the money or offering abstinence with no promise to help those people who cannot achieve abstinence. So be careful of the unwary embrace or of alternatives like we have in my country, drug courts, purporting to help people not be criminalized, which land up being two steps forward and three steps back in widening the net of the criminal justice system in this area. And finally, look for the opportunity to lead. It's not as if that only Europe can lead with harm reduction, or only America or Uruguay with cannabis reform, or only Latin America with initiating a debate about prohibition at the highest levels. The question becomes, are there opportunities in this country and in this region and continent to do productive science, health-based, human rights-driven interventions and policies with drugs that nobody else has done before? to come up with unique local solutions that make sense here, even though they're grounded in the same universal values. Because ultimately, ultimately, I hope I'm back here in 10 years. And I hope and I'm at a drug policy reform conference that has 1,500 people like we now have in my country and many thousands of others. I hope there's a movement of people from, from, racial, from, 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 from medicine and from science and from law enforcement and from across the political spectrum really building a movement to end the drug war in this country and not this country. I hope that the number of people locked up in your country on drugs is much lower instead of much higher 10 years from now. But it will only happen by understanding the potential to provide leadership, to challenge yourselves around your own prejudices, to understand the broader communities and values of which you are part, and to understand that we are about building a movement for science, compassion, health, and human rights. Thank you very much.